All right, I want to talk to you today about three logical fallacies of atheism. This is going to be a slightly different message than what I currently do. Um, this is directed to the atheist. Okay, this is not for Christians about what atheism is. All right, this is actually to atheists. And I'm doing this sermon, uh, this little study here uh, for the atheist people out there because I understand a lot of things that atheists stand for. I understand why you take certain stands. And um, I myself uh, was, I don't know if you could call it an, an outright atheist, but uh, atheistic for a little while there as a, as a teenager. I was raised, uh, forced to go to church every time the doors were open, kind of a deal. And, and, uh, and for a while, I, I kind of wanted to have a belief that God did not exist. And it's because I was looking at organized religion and not at a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. And before you jump to conclusions and start putting things in the comments and whatever else, what about this, what about that, whatever else, just open your mind a little bit and watch this video and uh, think about some of the things I'm saying here. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually tell you what I'm going to be talking about uh, so that you know what's coming up, so that there aren't any surprises for you, okay? Um, I've separated this into six different uh, little subjects. I'm going to talk about three uh, categories each. So first, we're going to talk about the three logical fallacies of atheism, okay? Why atheism is not logical. Uh, <clears throat> then I'm going to talk about three types of, of uh, atheists, okay? Then I'm going to talk about the future of atheism, three scriptures directed at atheists from the King James Bible, three serious scary warnings for atheists, and three things an atheist does not have to do to be saved, okay? That's what we're going to talk about. Now... This is a Christian channel, and um, I typically do not allow profanity in my comments section. Uh, just as a matter of you know respect, um, there are people that have small children that don't need their children seeing a lot of the filthy language and everything else. And so I would ask you, if you're an atheist, that you would please respect me enough to not fill the comment section up with a lot of profanity. Now, I'm going to leave, if you have if there are atheists that are going to post profanity, I'm going to leave those comments there because I do believe that there's a group of atheists that are very, very militant, aren't really you know, concerned much with facts and statistics. All they are trying to do is militantly spread their religious faith of atheism, and they're going to have a good time posting lots of profanity in the comments. So uh, I'm not going to delete the comments for this one video. All right, whatever the comments are, they're going to be down there whatever you post down there. Okay, now if you're putting links to, you know, pornographic websites or something like that, you know, that's inappropriate, okay, then you're going to be off. But whatever people write, whatever people say, it'll be down in the comments section. Now, three logical fallacies of atheism. Number one, and this is from years and years of dealing with atheists, okay? I'm not, you know, just, and, and by the way, I wrote some notes down here because uh, I don't just run my mouth in front of a web camera someplace. This is real outdoors here, by the way. You know, this is not a green screen in a multi-million dollar studio inside my Babel building, my, my church building, excuse me, if you're not familiar with my terminology. This is not some multi-million dollar studio, okay? This is on a lane going back to some land that I own, all right? Out in the northern, northeastern wilderness of Maine, okay, the state of Maine, all right? <clears throat> This is not rehearsed. There's not going to be any stopping, starting. If I mess up, it's just me. That's the way it is. Uh, I don't, I'm not really uh, one of the fake preachers out there. Okay, I, I don't exactly uh, ascribe to a lot of their philosophies. But anyhow, we're going to talk logical things now. All right, logic. All right, you, you, a lot of atheists out there say, "Well, we believe in reason. We don't believe in the faith and all this." Other. Okay, let's deal logically. And this, like I said, this is from dealing, me dealing personally with atheists. Logical fallacy number one that I get from most, most atheists is, number one, all Christians are or support hypocrites, pedophiles, and murderers. Okay? And I've gotten that thing for years and years and years. If you're a Christian, then you support all the wicked stuff that organized religion does. Okay? Number two, everything must be proved with science before it can be believed. That's another logical fallacy that atheists claim that they believe, but when you actually start to examine the facts, 
they don't really believe it. And if they believe it, they aren't really putting it into practice. And the third logical fallacy is being a Christian means you are part of organized religion. The third one kind of ties in with the first one. Okay, Now, it doesn't take a whole lot of study for an atheist or anybody who tries to defend atheism to look through what would be called church history, uh, secular church history. And if you type in the word Christian, I mean, you can do just a very simple Google search, type in Christian, it'll come up with Roman Catholicism. And that's where most atheists will stop with their research. Christianity is Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism has started lots of wars, including Adolf Hitler, you know, all these different things. I mean, it, again, that's a fact of history, by the way. Uh, Franz von Papen from Nazi Germany signed a concordant with the Vatican, Pope Pius XII, you know, before the war started. So I'm not just making that up. And, you know, Protestants do it too. Catholics and Protestants. You know, Protestants, if you're not aware of this, if you're an atheist and you haven't really studied this, the Protestants were people who protested, they were Catholics that protested certain abuses of the hierarchy of their organized religion, Roman Catholicism, in the Vatican. And so they protested it and they formed their own little miniature Vaticans out there. I'm not part of either one. And the Bible doesn't support either one either. Talk more about that later. But you say, why? well, how is this a logical fallacy? I don't understand. How can you say this is a logical fallacy for, you know, us to say, the atheist people out there to say that all Christians are or support the hypocrites, Christian hypocrites in the churches or pedophiles, the pedophile priests and murderers, religious murder, you know? Well, let me just say it this way. All atheists are into communism and slaughtering millions upon millions of people. Now, is that fair? You say, well, I've never killed anybody. Yeah, I haven't killed anybody as a Christian. You see? You say, you know, are you for the, the slaughtering of people in, in communist Russia and communist China? You know, the gulags and stuff like that up in Siberia and everything. And the, and the Chinese just slaughtering millions and millions of their own people. And by the way, the communists in, in both China and Russia killed a lot more people than, ever, than the Catholics ever did. And I brought this up with atheists, and they never really answered that well. But see, the philosophy is, you can blame me as a Christian for what Catholicism has done, but if I turn around and try to blame you for what communists have done, you say, hey, that's not fair. I don't believe that way. Well, neither do I when it comes to religious murders like that. You see? So that's a logical fallacy that a lot of atheists will stand up for. They'll say... You know, Christians are all murderers. They support murderers and stuff like this. They support the pedophile priests and everything. No, we don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. And what makes you think that people that are murdering for religious causes and people that go out and rape little children, telling them that I'm your priest, do this, you know, and, and hypocrites in the churches, what makes you think that they're actually Christians? See, that's a problem. That's a logical fallacy. The second one that I mentioned is that everything must be proved with science before you can believe it. Well, if you want to define science the real way, science is something that you can test, you can prove, and you can demonstrate. Now, you haven't tested and proved and demonstrated every single thing that you've ever believed in. All right, there's a whole lot of stuff that you take by faith I mean, when you get up in the morning, do you, do you do a scientific test on the floor to make sure that it can hold your weight? You walk into a building that's strange to you. Do you say, I need to do structural analysis before I walk into this building? No, you believe by faith that, okay, I can see the thing here. I guess it'll hold me. You know, well, there could be termites that, that, that ate out the floorboards and things and the, and the joists in the floor. How do you know? You get into a vehicle, some strange vehicle. How do you know when the guy turns the key that the thing isn't going to blow up? See what I'm talking about? You go out to eat, out at some restaurant. How do you know the food isn't poisonous? Are you really scientific? You know, I, I live by science. Really? You test and, and observe and demonstrate everything that you ever do? Of course not. But you say, you'll condemn me as a Christian because I talk about faith. But yet when you use faith, you just kind of, let's not mention that. Another logical fallacy another problem. 
Thirdly, being a Christian means you are part of organized religion. You know, if, you're, if you are, have any religious beliefs at all that there is a God, that there is a supreme being, then you're part of organized religion. You're no different than a Muslim or a Buddhist than, or a, a Catholic. Or a, it's just you lump everybody in all in one big thing called organized religion. Uh, well, that's nonsense. Again, can I lump you because you don't believe in God? Can I lump you in with other people that have no need for God? Communists and you get some rapist that doesn't believe that there's a God he's going to be held accountable to. And I can lump you in with him. See? It's a logical fallacy. You have a hypocritical stand. Most atheists have hypocritical stands that they take. You say, well, I know some that don't. Let's talk about that. On to the next section. Three types of atheists that I've run into in my life. Okay? Number one, you have evangelical atheists. You say, what are you talking about? Well, as time goes by, atheism is becoming more and more like a religion. Yeah, I mean, you can look it up in the faith traditions and stuff like this. Atheism is listed. Atheists are starting to buy church buildings and meeting on Sundays. You know, if I was an atheist, I'd, I'd be insulted by that. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, there are some that are out there. And you say, well, I'm not part of that. Yeah, I know. That's why I classified three different groups. See? Don't classify me with all the other organized religion people out there. Hear my case before you judge me. All right? But what are the evangelical atheists? How are they... How can you really spot one? Well, they will be militant activists for atheism. All right? Uh, there's a lot of those channels here on YouTube. Uh, they will go into the comment sections and they will say, Hail Satan or something like this. Or they'll try to blaspheme the Holy Ghost or something, you know, to prove how intelligent they are. Um, and they will just argue and argue and, and just... Most of them, to be very honest, to be very frank with you, I'm going to speak very bluntly here, most of them are simply watching videos like this because they have been watching pornography for the last hour or two and they just needed a break for a little bit. Don't kid me, okay? I was a pornography addict before I got saved, so don't tell me about it, all right? And I know why a lot of uh, porn addicts want to deny the existence of God, because there's a conscience there. And they don't like that feeling of guilt that comes from looking at pornography. So they just try to say there is no God to get rid of that feeling of guilt. We're going to be talking about that later, why you have that feeling of guilt, at least at first, until you've killed your conscience. But these evangelical atheists, as I call them, will use lots and lots and lots of profanity. They like to use the F word quite frequently. <laughs> you know, and that's what you're going to see down there in the comments. All right, You're going to see these young teenagers that are atheists. They've come out of high school. They've had their mind warped through evolution philosophy. And of course, evolution is a philosophy. Even if you want to claim it to be science, it still is a philosophy. The philosophy is that things get better over time. Things don't get worse, they get better. See? It is a, philo it, a philosophical uh, uh, system. You know, even if you want to claim it's science, it still is, there's a philosophy behind evolution. Things go up. The Bible says things come down, <laughs> which we'll talk about. The second type of atheist that I've dealt with over the years are what I would call fundamentalist atheists. <laughs> you know, because, see, I believe atheism is just another religion. But what is, it, what is a fundamentalist atheist? A fundamentalist atheist is one that really does study they study the arguments. They're not just, you know, they might not even watch pornography or whatever else. They just want to be left alone and left to not believe in God. And they will study all kinds of what they call science or, or whatever and arguments and things like this. They're very, very stubborn. Um, you can't get through to them. Even if you show them facts after facts after facts, they are, they stand by their beliefs of atheism. Uh, again, I've run into quite a few of those. And you exchange comments back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and uh, they won't budge. They're very much like fundamentalist uh, professing Christians. What are the third, what's the third type of atheist that I've run into? Well, I would call them the logical ones. 
um, they're not really even atheists. They are more agnostic. Uh, they just simply say, look, I see proof that this world evolved. I've seen science. I've seen this. I've seen that. Could there be a God? I don't know. That's what they say. They'll be more open-minded. They're a little bit more level-headed. They don't have to use a lot of profanity in their comments. Uh, they're, they're a little bit more scientific. And you know what? I don't have a big problem with those types of people. I mean, I'm a Bible-believing Christian preacher, but I'll tell you right now, somebody comes and they have questions, I'm all for questions. I'm all for somebody saying, hey, whoa, just, I need to see a little bit of proof of this type of stuff. That's fine. Okay? And we're going to be talking more about this as we continue through the study. But I've seen these types of people. And, you know, you have people in communist countries and things like that that are raised and there's no Bible allowed to be preached in their country and, and whatever. You know, they, they kick out any form of Christianity. A lot of the people would fall under that third class. They're more logical. They're more open-minded. They're not quite as stubborn. They don't have this extremist uh, kind of a zealot uh, religious, religious um, intolerance for anything else. They, they are more open-minded. Now, what about the future of atheism? Why am I doing this study? Well, um, there are some things coming to this world uh, that the Bible says would happen, and you can actually see it in the local news. I shouldn't say local news. I should say, well, local news too, but you can see it in news today. Now, let me just explain something to you. If there is a God that is outside of our time and our uh, reality, so to speak, in terms of I can't just say, oh, there he is, you know. No, no, no. He's, he's outside. He cannot be experienced with what we would deem as science. You cannot test him or, or prove him in the sense of by sight, and you cannot demonstrate how he does things. And in, in terms of, you know, having him make a tree grow right in front of you or something like this. Okay. If there is a God that is outside of our time, he should not be um, limited to only seeing things at certain periods of time. He should be able to tell you what's going to happen in the future. All right. That is a true test. All right. I mean, if I, if I said to you, uh, two years from now, you're going to be going to work and you're going to be in an accident with a, uh, a red Volvo station wagon or something like this, and two years from now it happens, um, there has to be something there, okay? It's not just a, a lucky guess. And I'm going to show you what the Bible actually has to say about this. And uh, so what are the three things that are going to be the future of atheism? Well, as time goes by, atheism is becoming more and more like a religion. You know, it's interesting because just a few days ago, I'm going to show the picture here on screen. A few days ago, the Pope was down in Bolivia and the president of Bolivia gives the Pope a sickle, a hammer and sickle, the symbols of communism, and it's a crucifix. Jesus on the crucifix there, but it's a hammer and sickle. It's like, you know, look, the symbols of communism and Jesus is on it. Catholic communism, you know, and, it, you know, and if you study it, Karl Marx and a lot of these other leading atheistic uh, scholars had connections to the Catholic Church. Hmm, interesting. But uh, as more and more time goes by, as I was talking about earlier, you're seeing more and more atheists trying to mimic Christianity or what people would call Christianity. You know, um, I'll just tell you right up front, I do not believe in church buildings. And we're going to talk more about this as we continue. I do not believe in buildings that you go to when you call that thing a church. Uh, that's not a New Testament teaching. And uh, I have a lot of studies on that. You can, you can see more about that. There's nowhere in the New Testament where you're told to build a building and call it a church and meet there every Sunday. That's not a New Testament practice. But you see atheism picking up that practice of organized religion and actually starting to uh, carry it out. And starting to act more and more like a religion. And like I said, you look at faith and values sections of newspapers and things, they'll have atheists in there. Now again, isn't that contrary to what you're supposed to stand for if you're an atheist? I mean, shouldn't you, that rub you the wrong way? Unless you're an independent fundamental atheist, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, you're, you're separate from these other people. But, you know, when you see the trend of atheism becoming more religious... 
it might want to set off a few little buzzers there in your mind going, uh-oh. Number two, future of atheism. Atheists want to see proof of the supernatural. I got into a debate with, with this one atheist the one time, and he said, you know, I don't believe in God. I don't believe that there is a God. I said, okay, what would it take to convince you that there is a God? He said, I'd need to see proof. I said, okay, if God, if a supernatural being showed up on the planet and he was able to do things and, and make things happen with nature and whatever else, if a supernatural being showed up on the planet and he said, I am God, would you believe in, in him then? And he was like, I guess I wouldn't have much of a choice. I guess I'd have to because he's there and he could, if he could prove that he's God, then I guess I would. And I said, you're falling into a trap into what the Bible said was going to happen. Let me show you. Second Thessalonians. You might want to look this up if you're an atheist. And you know, don't waste my time with trying to tell me about contradictions in the Bible and whatever else and things like that. Those are handled in other studies and other videos and things like this. We're talking about a few verses here that prophesy the future of atheism. Let's check about this. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to look at uh, verses 1 through 11. Paul is writing here, the, the Apostle Paul, one of the uh, men that got saved after Jesus died on the cross, if you don't know the story about Paul. And he is writing here to a group of Christians in Thessalonica. That's why it's called Thessalonians. They live in Thess Thessalonica. Verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye, be not, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Who is this man of sin? Keep reading. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. One of the most outstanding characters in the entire Bible is this man that's coming, this man called the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. He's called by a number of different names. And isn't it interesting that all of organized religion right now be they Jews, be they Muslims, be they Catholics, be they, you know, even a lot of the Christians are starting to believe in the, that there is no rapture, there is no catching away of the body of Christ, that, that Jesus is just going to come back. And all these different people are looking for this, this Savior to come. And I think a lot of atheists are looking for Him too. I want to see proof that God exists. Verse 5. Remember ye not that when remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And I've done a whole bunch of studies on that. We're not going to get into it here. You wouldn't understand it anyhow if you're an atheist. But the point of the matter or the, 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 the fact of the matter is it's talking about the body of Christ. This Antichrist cannot show up until the body of Christ has left. And we will be leaving. It'll be a good day for you if you're an atheist. If you're an atheist and you don't want to get saved, please pray to God and say, God, if you're real, I'd like you to show yourself, prove, prove to me that you're real by, um, by getting these Christians out of here. You know, I'd like to see that. Then people like me, if you hate me, you know, and stuff, and other Bible believers like myself, then uh, we'll be gone and you'll have the world to yourself. It's a good prayer request for you. Um, but uh, verse 7 for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. I think I already did read that, didn't I? Verse 8. Sorry about that. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Now look at this. Verse 11. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, not only is there going to be a supernatural being that shows up that people are going to worship as God, 
But if you go into that time period because you've rejected Jesus Christ, you've rejected a true relationship with Jesus, I'm not talking about organized religion. I reject organized religion. You reject Jesus Christ. And you go into this time period, God is actually going to send you strong delusion. I mean, you know, when you show up, you know, you see people and stuff and they're very powerful and great athletes and great soldiers and whatever else. And they do some amazing things and whatever and great feats of strength. But they're not supernatural. But what if you get a man who is supernatural that shows up? You know, that wicked him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. We're dealing with a supernatural being that's going to show up on the earth claiming to be God. And God is going to make the delusion of this guy so strong it's going to deceive people like you. Now, you say, this is all just fairy tale stuff. This is ridiculous. Let me ask you a question. Let's be logical for a minute. Um, do you think that organized religion it would reject a man showing up that's supernatural? What do you think is going to happen to you if this man does show up and you can see people talking about it, calling for it? Uh, what do you think is going to happen to you as an atheist that says, I don't want anything to do with religion if a supernatural being shows up claiming to be God? Let's just say for a minute that you somehow escape this strong delusion that's coming. You somehow maintain your sanity and you say, I don't believe in this stuff. This stuff is nonsense. What do you think is going to happen when the whole world is worshiping this guy and they're all just zealously just, oh, he's the Savior, he's the Messiah. He's, he's, he's God. Well, another place in the Bible it says that they will kill you thinking that they do God's service. There's some rough times coming for you if you're a real atheist. And I'm warning you about it. That's the purpose of me doing this video. But let's continue. The third point, the future of atheism. Well, actually, let, let me read another verse of Scripture. Revelation chapter 13. Turn back to the book of Revelation. And like I said, you know, I, I understand that they're atheists and they have questions about the Bible and things and they say, you know, uh, I don't believe in the Bible. The Bible's got contradictions and blah, 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 whatever, whatever, and things. The answers are there. I mean, you know, if you really, really want to find the truth, the answers are there, okay? Um, you can find the truth. But the main problem that I've found is the thing of self-righteousness. Uh, not wanting to think that you're a bad person, uh, not wanting to be part of organized religion and things. Which we're going to be talking about that as we continue. But I want to just show you another passage of scripture here that talks about this coming uh, man, this coming uh, antichrist. Revelation chapter 13 verses 11 through 18. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. Now this is symbolic. Okay, There's some things in scripture that are symbolic, some things that are literal. All right. Again when you're saved you're going to understand that more. Right? There's a lot of things that are not going to make sense to you until you come to God as a sinner, until you get saved and the Holy Spirit moves into you and you're able to understand these things. Again, I have other studies on that. All right? You can expect to say, God, you're going to show me all the truth and then I might get saved. It doesn't work that way. Again, I'm getting ahead of myself again here, but the point is, right there, when it says, another beast came up, coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. Well, who is a dragon in the Bible? The dragon is Satan. Satan appears as an angel of light, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But if you look at a pope, when he wears his one little hat thing, he turns to the side, that thing has got two horns, like that. It looks like a fish mouth. And if you study ancient Babylonian culture, uh, Dagon was one of their gods, and he was a fish. These ancient pagan people worship this fish god. Okay, that's why the priests of Dagon wore these hats that had like an open fish mouth. And you look at that thing from the side, it looks like two horns. Hmm. So let's continue. And by the way, this was written, the New Testament was written before the Vatican, you know, even really was in existence. 
So how did they know about that? Uh, way back there in the first century, how did John, that wrote the book of Revelation, how did he know about it? But I'm going to show you an even greater prophecy coming up here. Verse 12, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now again, it's speaking figuratively here of uh, you know the, the beast and things. Obviously, he's a man. He's not an animal, but it's speaking figuratively. And, you know, um, and he's, it's talking about the first beast being the Antichrist, the man of sin, we talked about earlier. Uh, and this guy basically causes the whole world to worship the Antichrist. And if you study it out, I believe that the Pope is the false prophet That's what, that we're reading about here. Verse 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. I don't want anything to do with religion. I don't want anything to do with religion. I'm just an atheist. I'm just going to do my own thing. Stay Organize religion. Stay away from me. Well, guess what? There's, according to this book right here, there's a fanatical brand of organized religion that's coming that will kill you, hunt you down and kill you. And it's coming in the future because you're not worshiping. I, I should say hunt you down and kill you because you won't worship their Christ. I'm not going to kill you. Okay, let me just say this. No Bible-believing Christian has ever hunted an atheist down and killed them. You won't find one verse of Scripture in the entire New Testament that says to a Christian, hey, go out there and hunt down the people that don't believe in God. Hunt them down and kill them. You won't find that in there. You say, what about all the war and all the fighting and stuff back in the Old Testament? God was dealing with the nation of Israel. It was a military setup. God was saying, okay, you go out there, you kill that country, you kill this one, you take over this one and stuff like that. That's what was going on there. Different setup. Completely different setup. Jesus Christ came and he said, okay, I'm fulfilling that Old Testament system of sacrifices and everything else here. I'm going to fulfill it. He showed up as their king. And if they would have accepted him, okay, things would have been different. But they rejected their king. They crucified their king. And so the Gentile world, the other people, the non-Jews can get in to the thing of salvation. Again, this is all their studies. But you know, I'm t and you say, well, I reject all this stuff, though. I reject it and everything. Okay, but listen to me. I'm trying to warn you about what's coming in the very near future. And you can see it. If your eyes are open, if you have any logical sense at all, you can see the fact that people are becoming more fanatical with their religious beliefs. Organized religion is more powerful now than it ever has been before. And they are all looking for a new age savior. All of them. Okay, verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Again, a lot of people laughed at that. They said, that's not possible. How can you have a mark in the hand or in the forehead? Now we have implantable microchips. Look at what they're for. Verse 17, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Three score means score is twenty, so you get three score, it's sixty. So six hundred sixty and six. Six six six. If you don't know where that came from, right there you're looking at it. Okay? Now, I've done whole teachings on this thing of the mark of the beast, this whole system, and Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 12 says if you take that mark in this time period that's coming, if you take that mark, you go to hell without any possible way of getting out of that thing. So it's very, very, very dangerous to take that thing. But you see, again, how did they know this? How did John know that back in the first century? How could he have prophesied this thing to happen? You say, well, this is, this is getting out of the realm, the realm of science. This is going into the supernatural. Yes, I know that. I know that. Okay? I'm not denying that I'm a religious man. I'm not denying that I have faith. I'm not denying those things. What I'm saying to you is, what are you going to do with this? 
If you're just purely scientific, I have to see, I have to, to have everything proven to me, whatever else. What do you do with a book, even if you just want to make the King James Bible, written in 1611, all right? 1611, started in 1604, finished in 1611, seven year work on this book. How would they, or why would they write a, a thing about a, a, a whole world worshiping a man and having a one world monetary system that's controlled with a mark that's in the hand or in the forehead 400 plus years ago? Why would they write about a thing like that? It's a supernatural book, that's why. But let me show you another very shocking verse. Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. If you don't uh, you know, want to believe in these things, you say, I need to see proof of God. Well, you see, you're going to see proof of a supernatural being showing up claiming to be God, but it goes even farther than that. You're actually going to see proof of God himself, the creator, the real God. Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. You see, in this coming time period, where there will be a one world government, a new world order, God is actually going to be showing amazing judgments upon this earth. It's going to be really, really, really bad. Very bad. And it's going to confirm the New Testament, the book of Revelation. It's specifically to the Jewish people, but the whole world, they're going to get you know, pulled into this thing and it's going to be a bad, bad time. Uh, the only way out of it is to get saved and the body of Christ, you know, we get, we leave before the thing happens. Okay, again, that's a whole other subject. Don't, don't, you know, oh, that's ridiculous, it's great. Listen to the other subjects or the other sermons on this subject. Okay, but you see that thing there. And it's ironic because after the mystery of God is finished, and people can actually see God, they're actually going to see the proof of God, the real proof of the real true God, they're actually still going to be blaspheming Him. So don't tell me, oh, there are atheists out there that we could, if we could just see proof of God, then we'd accept God and everything. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. There are atheists out there that hate God, that hate the concept of God, and even when God shows up, even when God reveals Himself to man, when you can look up and you can see God, you know, in this future time period, people still are blaspheming him. They still hate him. Okay? Now I'm going to read three scriptures that are directed exactly, or pointed right at atheists. All right? Psalm 14. Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3. This is what this book here says about you, if you're an atheist. It says here, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. You say, well, that's a really harsh thing to write about an atheist. Well, it gets worse. Verse 2, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men. In other words, everybody to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And we're going to see later on what God did about this situation here. So don't think to yourself, well, God hates just atheists. No, uh, and, and God doesn't hate you, by the way. Uh, he provided a way out, uh, a way for you to be saved and go to heaven, but uh, which we'll be talking about later. But uh, God looks down at all people. Why? All of sin can come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. There's nobody down here that can claim that they're perfect. But God made a cure for that. Romans chapter 1. See, that's Old Testament. Well, let's go to the New Testament then. Romans chapter 1, right after the book of Acts. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, says here, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all, unrighteous, or all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, like a lot of atheists do. 
because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You do not have any excuse at all to believe that there is no God. I mean, if you're sitting there at that computer or your iPhone or whatever else you're watching this video on, if you're sitting there and you can say, well, this computer or this technological whatever gadget was created by man, but the grandeur of nature happened by random chance. I don't think so. You see, that's not logical. I mean, the complexity of nature is such that there has to be a creator. This could not have happened by random chance. You did not happen by random chance. No way. No possible way. That's why a lot of atheists, by the way, interestingly, a lot of the atheistic science guys, the uh, evolutionists and things like this, are starting to believe in uh, aliens, basically. <laughs> you know, aliens seeding man on the planet billions of years ago, or whatever, millions of years ago, whatever the number is. You know, they always change the numbers around and stuff, you know. They're starting to have to admit that there had to have been some kind of a divine, some kind of a, a higher intelligence to create all of this. It couldn't just happen by chance. Verse 21, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Remember who it said? The fool has said in his heart there is no God. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And that's exactly what a lot of the atheists have done. You get to a point where you deny God and you deny the Lord and you just deny and you make fun of the Bible and whatever else. Eventually, God gives you up. He just simply says, okay, you want to do those things? Go ahead and do them. You want to mess around and stuff like that? Go ahead. The worst thing that God can do to you is to let you have your way. The absolute worst thing He can do to you. I've got some horse flies right now flying around my head. They're, you know, they like to bother me when I'm out here. Uh, apparently think I'm pretty sweet or something. I don't know. Even though a lot of you out there don't. But uh, I'm kind of glad you don't think I'm sweet, actually. Um, but another one here. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. Another scripture that's directed uh, at atheism. 1 Timothy 6.20 says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Uh, for something to be qualified as science, it has to be able to be observable, testable, demonstrable. Okay? And a lot of evolution does not fall into that category. It must be believed by faith. And you can do all the ranting and raving and yelling and putting little you know, copying, pasting from your atheistic websites and whatever else, down in the comments, you can do all that stuff that you want. But the fact of the matter is there are many parts of evolution which must be believed by faith. Okay? Uh, I'll give you a good example. Irreducible complexity. All right? There are a lot of things within an ecosystem that if you take a few of them out, the ecosystem falls apart. There are many flowers which require certain bugs to be in the area, for the flower to be pollinated, for the flower to perpetuate. Uh, there are many things, many functions in your body that if they had evolved in a slow, gradual process, it couldn't have happened. All your bodily systems had to be there working all at the same time for the body to work. And I mean, there are tons of examples of this stuff. So when you come out and you tell me that, that science has disproved the Bible, uh, no, it hasn't. Okay, that is, that is an opposition of science falsely so-called. And I don't fall for it. Two more sections here and then we're done uh, for you if you're still watching. Hopefully you are. Uh, three serious scary warnings for atheists. Okay, If this book is true, and let's be logical, let's be scientific. 
if there is a God, if you can say, if you are at least uh, logical enough to say, well, I cannot say that I have all knowledge, that I understand 100% of everything, that I've been everywhere, that I can say everywhere I've been and all the knowledge that I have in the universe, I understand everything, and God does not exist. That's, that's ridiculous. Nobody has that ability. So if you can be logical enough to say God could exist somewhere, I just haven't experienced him yet. Well, the Bible could be true. If it's true, I'm going to show you some really scary things that you better think about. So you're gambling right now. All right? You are gambling and saying, I think that this happened by chance. Or at the very least, if there is a God, I'm going to gamble and say, maybe he's a nice guy. Maybe he's the kind of guy that will just take it easy on me and stuff. And because he could, you know, I could see that there's corruption in organized religion. So therefore, God won't be too rough on me because, you know, after all, how could he be too rough on me when I could see the corruption? Uh huh. Yeah, sure. You know, I'm going to show you some scary things that you better think about before you continue with your gamble. Romans chapter 2. Some things in this book here. Another reason why a lot of people reject this book is because this book is against them. This book was against me. Okay, Romans chapter 2, verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. You know, it's interesting. Everybody out there comes, when you're born, you come from God, programmed with His laws in your heart. Nobody out there says, you know what, I think it's perfectly fine to steal. I think there's nothing wrong at all with stealing. You know, I mean, as long as it's somebody else's stuff, right? You know, somebody steals your belongings, all of a sudden it's a major crime. You know, I got to call the police and stuff like this. You know, you don't, don't, you know, get all philosophical. Well, if somebody really needs something and they can steal and blah, blah, blah. You wouldn't feel that way if it was your things that they stole. Somebody needed some things and you come home and your whole house is just bare inside. You'd go, eh, that's okay. Man, maybe you've gotten to that point after years and years and years of killing your conscience. So now you're just brain dead and you don't care anymore. You know, but the fact of the matter is anybody out there does not like to have their things stolen. Um, another one, thou shalt not kill. Who out there says, I think it's perfectly fine to murder people? You wouldn't do that. You don't believe that way. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You're married, you come home, your wife is in bed with another man, you aren't going to go, eh, yeah, yeah. Unless you've been, been given over to a reprobate mind. Unless your, your mind is fried. If you truly love somebody, if you truly are in love with your wife, you don't want her messing around with other people. You know, with other men. You know, and I go on and on. You know, honor thy father and mother. You know, who out there thinks it's okay to dishonor your parents? See, God's law is written in your heart. And the only way that you can get rid of that thing is to kill your conscience. But now I'm going to show you the scary verse. Verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Paul there, the gospel that was committed to Paul. But you see... There's going to come a time when God is actually going to judge your secrets. You know those things that you did that nobody else knows about? Another portion of Scripture talks about your thoughts. God's going to bring your thoughts into judgment. Someday you're going to stand before God and all the holy angels and all the saints, all the people that are saved, everything else. You're going to stand before them and all your dirty laundry, all the secret things that you've done, that you thought that you've gotten away with that nobody knows about, they're coming out at the judgment. Do you want that? You say, well, I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in the Bible. But what if it's so? If you have to stand before God and give an account for yourself, which is what happens if you reject Jesus Christ, your secrets are going to come out. Now you see, back before I got saved, and I was a religious, you know, and everything else. But I wasn't really saved. I was just a phony Christian. And I actually started to study the Bible and things and look at the Bible. And, and I started to realize, you know, I've got some real skeletons in my closet, so to speak, that I don't want those things coming out. And the only way out of it is faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. I'm talking about that here in a couple minutes. How you can get out of that thing of having your secrets aired before 
the entire host of heaven. It'd be an, a humiliating thing to have to stand there and uh, in your own self-righteousness and give an account for your secrets. That's scary. Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five, verses seven through eleven. Now this is talking about Christians here, but I'm going to show you this. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seven. For we Christians walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. I'm ready to go to heaven. I don't fear death. I'm not looking forward to death. I'm not saying, wow, it'd be great to die. You know, no, 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 no. No, you know, there are some painful ways to die. I understand that. But I know what's coming after, after death. I go to heaven when I die. Okay? So I'm willing rather to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Verse 9, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to the, that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You see, even as a Christian, even as a Bible-believing preacher, even, even though I'm saved, I'm still going to be judged someday for what I've done. Now, my secrets, my sins of my past, they're covered. They're under the blood of Jesus Christ. That blood that He shed on the cross, that paid for those sins. I don't have to worry about the sins coming up. But what I do as a Christian, my life, if I've preached the Word or, or, or witnessed to people or done good things for the Lord and things like that, those things are going to be judged. If I've wasted my life away watching TV and messing around with sin and whatever else and, you know, filthy TV and stuff like this and movies and listening to the wrong kind of music and drunkenness and fornication and drugs and whatever else, I'll be judged for that. See, we're all going to stand before some kind of a judgment. Judgment is inevitable, whether you're saved or lost. But if you're saved, then you have an advocate. See? That's the difference. But now look at this instruction here for a Christian. You say, well, I don't care about any of this stuff. I don't care. I reject religion and everything else. Look at this. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Okay? Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's why I'm here speaking to you. I know the terror of the Lord. I know what God can do to you. Okay? I can speak from personal experience as a false religious convert for many, many years, until I was 25 years old. I was a false religious convert. And I lived very, very wickedly. You know, my secrets were very wicked. But uh, outwardly, I was a very righteous guy. A goody two-shoes, you know, religious hypocrite. Organized religious hypocrite is what I was. And uh, God punished me a bunch of times. There were a bunch of things that went wrong that were bad. And I saw things that happened to uh, people in high school that I knew. Lost people that had no desire for God. I saw things that happened. God can be very, very severe. Very severe. I'm going to show you that. Revelation chapter 20. You know, a lot of these modern churches are trying to get rid of stuff like this. They'll try to tell you that this doesn't exist because they want your money. I don't want your money. Uh, again, you don't see some big church building out here. I'm not in, you know, some big church building. I'm just out here in nature. And you're never going to see me in a big church building begging, you, you know, for you to pay my mortgage. It's not going to happen. Revelation chapter 20, we're going to start at verse 10 and read down to verse 15. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And by the way, you know, I know a lot of you probably have all kinds of questions, all kinds of smart little things that you've thought up that you just know that no Christian's ever been able to answer. Uh, well, if you really want truth, uh, get saved, and then the Lord will show you a lot of that stuff. And I mean, look at my channel. I've got over 800 videos, a lot of subjects covered. So if you really want the answers to your questions, they're out there, okay? But if you just want questions, you know, to avoid truth, just continually question, what about this, and what about that, and what about this, what about that? I'm not going to fall for that, okay? I've done that many, many, many years with atheists, and it all goes back to the thing, are you a sinner? No, I'm not a bad person. Okay, conversation's over. 
I can't help you because I can just, we can play a little, you ask me a question and I give you the answers game for, you know, weeks on end and you just waste my time. And quite frankly, if you don't want to get saved, I'm wasting your time. But uh, verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small, and great stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You say, well, that's just for a temporary thing. You just kind of burn up and whatever else, like a lot of the false prophets are teaching. Uh, no, actually, it says here, uh, verse 11, Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, and worship, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. That's what's coming for you if you reject Jesus Christ, All right? Now you say, but see, I don't believe in it. To me, it's just fairy tales. It's just, it's just you know, Aesop's fables or Greek pagan myths or, or mythology or whatever else. Okay, but you're gambling. You see, fairy tales don't prophesy, accurately prophesy the future. And like I said, scientifically look at the news. Scientifically look and see how the Pope is going to country after country after country and presidents giving him gifts and bowing down to this. I thought he was a head of a religion. Why are world leaders bowing down to this man? And why is the Pope coming to America and addressing Congress in late September? Again, I have a video on that. Why? Why? I mean, you're an atheist. You say, I reject religion. Then why is your secular government having the head of a religious church addressing it in September. Shouldn't that kind of freak you out a little bit? Well, if you know what's coming, if you understand some things, and if you can see how things are shaping up, yeah, it should really, really freak you out. That's why I'm warning you. And by the way, the thing of, of wisdom, you know, Wisdom starts when you start to fear God. Read Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, if you want to know about that. Now, finally here, in closing, three things an atheist does not have to do to be saved. This is very important. Number one, you do not have to join organized religion. You say, you know, I'd be saved if it wasn't for the fact that I, I just don't want to go and be part of this whole organized religion thing. Praise the Lord. I'm not part of organized religion. Okay, we are Christians have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't need anybody else in terms of my salvation. If, you know, I have to be a member of 10, at least 10 people for me to be saved. No, 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 no. Me and God, personal relationship. I don't have to be part of a denomination. I don't have to wear some special clothing or whatever else. You know, me and the Lord. You don't have to be part of organized religion. You can stand against organized religion. I mean, welcome to the Bible-believing world, you know? Hebrews chapter 9. And you know, again, you say, well, you're quoting all the Scripture, and I don't believe in the Bible, blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, you ought to read the Bible sometime, and you'll see how different what the Bible presents is comparing it to organized religion. It's not even the same thing, you know? Most of what falls under organized religion today has no basis at all in Scripture. None. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, is that true? Say the Bible's not a scientific book. Okay. Can you show me one example of a man who didn't die? You say, well, the Bible's... I thought you didn't believe in the Bible. You see? You say, well, then that's a contradiction to the Bible. No, because the Bible, God, it, it's a supernatural book. God can interject and say, okay, that person's not going to die. This person's not going to die. You know, supernatural. See, you get into the supernatural realm, things change. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment, as I've been saying. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, 
And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. All right. True saving faith is what was done on the cross. Calvary. Back there in the first century. It's not you have to come and be part of this organized religion. Make sure you tithe and make sure that you come to mass. Make sure you confess your sins to the priest in the auricular confessional booth and stuff like this. And, or you have to take pilgrimages to Mecca. And, or you have to go and you have to go to the wailing wall and you have to do the little thing that the Jews, the Orthodox Jews do. No, 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 no. Once and done. You want to get saved? All right. It happens once and you're done. That's it. Number two, people say, I don't, I don't think I want to become a Christian because I don't want to go to church. You ready for a shocker? The term go to church or going to church or we've gone to church does not appear one time in the King James Bible. Not once. It's not in there. And again, I have whole studies on this. You can look it up. Church in your New Testament is a reference to the people. The people with personal relationships with God through Jesus Christ. You can be saved without going to church. In fact, if you get saved, stay away from the churches. Again, I've talked about this in other studies. If you're an atheist and you don't know about this, church buildings are under IRS code. It's called Section 501c3. They are charitable organizations. You know, I, again, the stand of a Bible believer. This might shock you. A Bible-believing Christian does not believe... I mean, I'll say it this way. Let me rephrase it. We believe in the separation of church and state. We do not believe in a state-run church. We're very much opposed to that. That's the stand of a Bible-believing Christian. All right? 501c3 church buildings are state-run churches. And then they're going to become... That's going to become a lot more apparent here in the future. Very much more apparent. Now that the uh, gay marriage stuff has passed and everything, and they're saying churches are going to be forced to perform gay marriages. Why? They're state institutions. They're institutions of the federal government. So if you want to be saved, stay away from the church buildings. You say, what am I supposed to do? Get a King James Bible. You say, why King James Bible? Well, again, big study. You're going to have to study this thing, you know. You have to learn, educate yourself. The King James Bible is from a completely different set of Greek manuscripts for the New Testament and even Hebrew manuscripts back in the Old Testament. There's differences there between this one and the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church, organized religion, you know. They put out all these other ones, the NIV, the New American Standard, the English Standard Version, all this other stuff. You know, even the New King James Version, the Vatican had a hand in that. And that stuff you stay away from. Okay, the King James Bible is the only one that has it right. Okay, Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, verse 11 and 12. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. And every tongue shall confess to God, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You see, you can go to some Babel building someplace, some little church, and you can say, oh, well, my pastor says, oh, well, the people here believe, or our denomination holds this truth or whatever. You can't hide behind that. Someday when you stand before God, you're going to give account of yourself to God. You you can't say, well, that preacher, that, that mean, nasty Brian Denlinger, that the preacher, he, he offended me, and, and, and I really didn't. Uh-uh, uh-uh. What does the book say? You're going to give an account. The Bible says that you will be judged by the words that Jesus spoke. These words right here are going to judge you someday. According to the Bible. You say, I don't believe it. Okay. Take your chances. But what if you're wrong? I mean, you know, again... Let's logically consider this. What if I'm wrong? Well, I'll die someday and I'll return to the dirt and I'll just not exist anymore. And uh, I'll be able to say, you know, people will be able to say about me rather, that, uh, well, he lived a good life. He lived a clean life. He didn't uh, mess around and, and cheat on his wife. He didn't get drunk. He didn't do drugs, you know, whatever. I mean, what do you really have? You know, if you're an atheist, what can you really do that I can't do? What do you have to offer me? Not one thing. 
You say freedom from religion. I am free from organized religion. You say, no, but freedom from believing in God. How does that hurt me? How does it hurt me for me to come out here and look at this and say, wow, there must be a creator. There must be a God that created all this amazing nature and everything else. How does that hurt me? You say, well, you'd be able to look at pornography, uh, uh, you know, and, and not feel any guilt for it. Um, I used to try that. I used to look at lots and lots and lots of pornography. You know what? Never satisfied me. Never made me happy. And the nature of perversion is you start out looking at Playboy and then you start to go to Penthouse and then you go to Hustler and then you start to look at websites and internet and all this other stuff. See? It has to get more and more perverse as time goes by to get more and more of a thrill. Next thing you know, you're living in some dingy place someplace looking at child pornography. Oh, not me, not me. You know, I'm, I'm happy with normal pornography for now. Perversion gets worse over time. And I, by the grace of God, God saved me before I ever got into child pornography too. Let me, let me say that. But I looked at some very wicked things before the Lord saved me. Finally, you say, I don't want to have to do certain things to be saved. How about uh, cleaning up your life to be saved? Uh, no, that comes afterwards. God will come into your life and He'll clean up things. He'll tell you what to clean up. He'll tell you what to get rid of. And He'll do it by the standards of His Word. Luke chapter 5. Apparently my popularity is getting better with these uh, horse flies. They're really loving me now. Luke chapter 5. Verses 30 through 32. Let me show you. You want the qualifications, whether or not you qualify to be saved? Let me show you. Luke chapter 5, verse 30. But their scribes and Pharisees, organized religion in other words, murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Are you sick and tired of this world? Are you an atheist that's uh, tried everything? That's tried to find happiness in pornography? that's tried to find happiness in alcohol, that's tried to find happiness in all the things that the world has to offer. Are you sick of it? The Bible says that's who Jesus came for. He didn't come for the organized religion. He didn't come for the self-righteous people that say, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, I do lots of good things. That's not who Jesus came for. Jesus came for the brokenhearted. Jesus came for those people that say, I'm a sinner and I want out of this system. That's where I got out. I was a sinner. I was sick and tired of sin. I knew it didn't satisfy. I wanted something different. I wanted something unique. And there is nothing more unique than a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Not one thing. You come to God as a sinner. You come just as you are. Don't try to clean up your life. God wants you to come to Him as a sinner. Honesty is what the Lord wants. He doesn't want you to want to look down and say, Oh, you know, what do I got to do? I'll just pray this special little prayer here and then I get into heaven and I'll go to some church someplace and become part of the fellowship and whatever. No, 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 no. He wants to deal with you one-on-one. -on -one. Not through a denomination. Not through organized religion. Not through whatever else. God wants you in a personal relationship. That's what He wants. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go through all the scriptures that show you how to be saved. Because we have a salvation message over at my main channel. I'm on this channel here because my channel is currently suspended because a bunch of Satanists uh, put a copyright claim on one of my videos. It was fair use and whatever else. Big story. But, uh, you know, go to my main channel. I'm going to put a link here at the end. You can go and you can watch the salvation message. It'll tell you, take you through the Bible. Not my opinions. Through the Bible and show you how to be saved. And let me tell you something. You say, I'm not convinced. I, I think that this is a stupid thing. This, this was really dumb and whatever else. Okay. Keep telling yourself that as you see atheism becoming more and more religious. As you see more and more people calling for this new age Christ. Because it's coming. It's coming. And let me tell you something. If you fear organized religion, that proves you've got some good sense. 
and the greatest, most wicked, most evil, most powerful organized religion that's ever existed is yet to come in the future. You talk about fanaticism. I mean, organized religions in the past have worshipped men. How about when a supernatural man shows up? Satan basically walking and talking on the earth, if you study it out. People are going to go crazy in that time period. The Bible says back in Revelation chapter 6 that they're going to behead those who do not follow their system. So you say, I'm an atheist, I'm never going to fall for organized religion. Okay. If you hold to that, if you get into that time period, you miss the rapture, you, you miss, miss the catching away of the body of Christ. If you miss it and you go into this time period and you hold to this thing of I'm not going to worship, you're going to get your head cut off. You're going to be an enemy of the state and they're going to kill you. Religious fanaticism, hunting you down like an animal. I'm trying to warn you. Watch the news. You can see it happening. You can see them calling for a new world order a one world government, a one world, a new world economic order. The Pope just said it just the other day. You better get saved. Time's running out. Okay, that's going to be it for the video. Please watch the salvation message. Thank you for watching.